Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Piware Night School, a special edition here for the Piware <clears throat> Social Distance Drill Challenge. I'd like to welcome Mike Gaines, Bob Buckner, Kevin Nix, and Tim Fairbanks. They were our judges for the competition. Uh, thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks for judging this. This has been a lot of fun. So thanks for having I us. hope you all had fun doing it as well. That's mm -hmm. great. Thanks. Really awesome. <laughs> We'll let people Very join cool. up here. We got several people coming in still. So, uh, how <clears throat> how did y'all like this? This is kind of a new thing for us as well, and I know everybody is uh, in the same boat currently. Um, what did y'all think about this kind of an impromptu type thing that uh, works in, with the situation we're in? I loved it. I thought it, I thought it was clever. I thought it was. Um, were you asking us or were you asking attendees? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, no, I thought I thought it was really fun. Um, you know, it was obviously the first time that we've done something like this. So, um, you know, initially it was hard to, there were so many um, variables, I suppose, you know, right. when we first looked at it and we, we all talked about that, how, uh, you know, what kind of things that should we be looking for and all, all of that. But in, in terms of the world that we're in right now, um, it was just a lot of fun to have an event of any sort, you know what I mean? Right. I also think it was a, it's almost a learning tool to people who are competing and they don't judge very often or they haven't been in the judging arena because, you know, even given, given the same parameters, the show concept, the music, the choices that people make are so incredibly different one to the next, mm -hmm. which is how that you know, the, the whole aspect of judging comes into play and how you, you view things differently over and over again. So it's, it's very interesting how, you know, with the same ex idea in music, there was, you know, 35 different ideas, drill-wise and staging-wise. Yeah, it really made me realize how um, important it is in BOA, DCI, WGI, that the judges do have sheets to work from. Right. Because we didn't have sheets to work from, and so the parameters were kind of just wild and wide open, which made it really interesting for all right. of us to judge. Well, giving, given such a, uh, a wide hoop to jump it through, basically. <laughs> yes. So, well, so we posted the video yesterday. That was uh, 10 contestants. Uh, what that was was the every judge was uh, given the uh, task of picking their top three. So um, we had a couple of overlap. And this is how we got the top 10 for this particular competition. Um, let me go ahead and release the top three. Okay, so <clears throat> in honorable mention, we have, let's see here, James Hensley from Marching Warehouse and John Mashburn. Those were our honorable mention and our grand prize winner and uh, recipient of $1,000 will be Eric Robertshaw. Congratulations, Eric. That's awesome. Congratulations. Congratulations. This was such an awesome competition. Um, pretty much all the contestants that we had actually had uh, an issue with being too close within that six feet, whether it was just for one count or not. So it's it, it's a very difficult thing to accomplish. So I want to thank everybody for taking advantage and uh, joining us. This has been such a fun competition. Um, I want to open up the the room for questions. If you have any questions about the uh, for the judges, um, any design questions. Um, anything that you'd like to see in the future, uh, if you'd like to do these competitions in the future as well. So, <clears throat> um, next time we're going to have a few more rules and uh, hone it in a little bit to make it a, a little bit easier on our judges. So, <laughs> says, Victor says, uh, sadly, you're right up against the survival finale. <laughs> <laughs> This is why you didn't take advantage, I guess, Victor. <laughs> That's funny. okay. Let's pull up some. Of, let's pull up the winning show right quick and show everybody. 
All right. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us on a new platform. We're going to be migrating all of our sessions over to this platform. All righty. All right, we have our, let's open up Eric Robert Shaw. Here we go. Okay. Let's see here. Here we go. And we have Eric. Let's get the hey, audio. There we go. All right, here's our Drill from Eric Robertshaw, the grand prize winner. Just go around the table and get everybody's thoughts on the winner and uh, what you liked about it. Any 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 critiques that you might have had or one of the first things that, that caught my eye was, and I thought it was a really good design choice. Is at the beginning going from the scatter, um, he created a, a focal point with the group of four that just kept rotating and building upon itself. Mm -hmm. So even though you were coming from all different directions and it was a scatter form resolving there was a central focus that kept drawing your eye to one spot. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good uh, lesson for people designing just in general. Um, you know, when you when you do a lot of that freeform type staging, there still has to be something of focus. It can't be so random that the viewer and the judges do not understand what's, what's actually happening. Right. So I thought that was done really well at the beginning. Great. Uh, I generally, I just enjoyed the, the composition in general. Um, and I really thought it was clever that he was able to work at the end of it to work in the six feet. So we get the mm -hmm. obvious conclusion and, and message at the end of it. Um, uh, when we were having our judging session the other night, one of the things that came up was how much, uh, we really had three things. We had, um, I guess, coordination and composition and COVID. Mm -hmm. and so if, if you're going to give it a, um, you know, if you're going to rate it on that, it had to have some components. And I thought he did a really good job of doing, uh, he, he just accomplished all that. I thought it was, I thought it was really smart, uh, really professionally done. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the things that I liked too was that the COVID um, in this 
particular composition was done through the actual drill design and not just through like a flag design or through costuming. Um, and as the drill designer, that's often one of our, our goals because we know the color guard people are going to make the show come to life with the color palette and the flags and the costumes. But if, if there's a way that we can make the uh, storyboard happen as well, that's always a, a bonus. And I thought that he did that really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, just so everyone knows, like a lot of the things we talked about uh, when we got together was how much to value everything. Um, you know, certainly something that was in all of our minds was th were things like, um, you know, the audio to visual coordination, the staging and the instrumentation uh, that came into play. For example, if, if we saw something that was, was pretty cool, but then you look at it like they are never gonna play together. We thought it was important that shows that were achievable and presented the uh, opportunities for achievement for the students, that was important. In addition to the six foot spacing was kind of a, a you know pretty strict rule throughout the show, you had to have that. And uh, you know we, we realized that there were several shows that <clears throat> if you just looked at the, each page, it, you had the six foot spacing, but there were a lot of times where people were coming really close together. And so given that this was a contest about the social distancing, we felt that uh, those that kept that spacing both on the dot as well as in transition was was another important uh, point as well as the overall just interesting composition um, you know textural variety staging of the different instruments all of that came into play um, and we uh, pretty unanimously I believe thought that uh, this first place group uh, did did all of that pretty well yeah great we have a couple of questions um, <clears throat> Here's the one to everybody. What made you all want to become drill writers? Like, and this is verbatim. Like what convinced you that, yep, this is it. <laughs> what was that point in time? Maybe I should go first. <laughs> uh, and the reason I say that, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, pretty confident that I'm the oldest one in this group. <laughs> and, uh, and what got me into it was, you know, I wrote for my own band and I went through two or three different styles. My first style was Cassavant. And those of you who do not know that name need to know that name and you need to look at the work that that man did. And there's actually still some stuff around on, on YouTube. Um, but uh, I went from that to, to Moffitt to then the, uh, I saw my first drum corps in 1970 at the, at the world open um, at the Manning bowl. And after I saw that, I came home and threw an entire show out that I'd written, music, drill, everything, and changed everything I was doing and had no idea what I was doing, how to write the drill. Um, but I, what really helped me was that I'd had experience charting with the Moffat stuff and with the CAS event. So I just sort of charted it the same way. And it, and it worked. And I, I was really relieved, uh, to be honest with you, because I've seen a lot of people that that don't work that way. And what got me into the business was, as I took my band to a contest, um, Cary, North Carolina, I think fall of 1972. Um, and I had a gentleman after our band performed came up after the, after the contest. And I asked, he asked me if I would write a show for him. Well, lo and behold, I mean, I would have done it for free, you know, right. <laughs> when someone flatters you like that. And I might add, this fellow's name is Ed Taylor. Ed Taylor's 92 years old. He's still living. I talked to him about a week ago. That's awesome. Uh, still as sharp as he can be. He was a wonderful band director who spent 39 years in the same town and just produced excellence year after year after year. And that's what got me started with it. And after uh, going to Bands of America in 1979, um, I had resigned actually before the trip. So when I left, um, my entire livelihood was going to depend on um, show design, uh, producing some camps and things like that. And then for about eight years, about all I did was, was write. And then I got back into band directing. But um, I don't think there was a voila moment. And I think you need to be really careful about just making that choice unless you, until you find out if you're any good at it. Because um, there, there are a lot of people out there right now that, um, 
that call themselves show designers and they produce shows and they, and, and the four of us, I'm sure see a lot of those during the fall. And, and some of those people are really good, really talented, wonderful writers and some are not. And, and it's sort of, I, I, I sort of have the analogy that sometimes people got halfway through an ed degree and realized that was too hard. So they decided they, they like marching band. So they do show design. And I don't think that's the way to go into it. <laughs> I think you need to be inspired with it, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thank you, mom. Who wants to go next? Are we going by seniority? I think that would probably be me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so for me, it was a little different in that I taught, I was a high school band director and um, I taught for 19 years, but kind of out of necessity of, and you know, unfortunately this is kind of part of the, the drill rider game is out of necessity of not getting it on time and not communicating through the fall and just the stress that you go through. If you happen to get one of those drill riders that's like that, I just decided that it would be less stressful if I did it myself mm -hmm. than to have to, you know, wait on someone else. And so just out of necessity started doing it really is, is what happened. Um, that, and then like, like Bob said, when you, it, when you have a little bit of success and people start hiring you, it was easy to go, well, if I, you know, write six shows, that's as much as I make as a full-time teacher. And I'm not in the classroom. I'm not dealing with parents and I'm not having to do emails. <laughs> so, so for me, it was the joy of not having to teach anymore. Not that I didn't like that because the kids are great, but it's the other stuff that goes along with it. So it was a, it was an avenue to be able to get out of the classroom and still be involved in the activity that you enjoy so much, you know? Right. So that was what it was for me. Great. Michael? Uh, yeah, I, I guess the, the short version of the story is um, I started out teaching and designing color guard shows, indoor winter guard shows. And um, I was also teaching Cavaliers at that point, and they asked me uh, to help out um, with their show in, in 1992 because Steve Brubaker had uh, gotten sick and wasn't able to do all of it. So there were about four or five of us that uh, agreed to do it. And um, so, yeah, so that was my first outdoor drill was Cavaliers, part of that show. So that wasn't stressful at all. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then be, uh, I started doing like my own high school band after that. Um, and a couple of the bands that uh, Steve could no longer do, he asked me to do. And so I started kind of messing with that and pretty quickly realized that I wanted to do all of that for living um, and not use my finance degree, which my parents I'm sure were thrilled with when I told them that <laughs> two or three years after I graduated, I'm not gonna use that degree anymore. Um, so yeah, but from there, I, I just I just kept going with with all things pageantry and uh, yeah, it's been, it's, it's been a great career, but um, it's one of those where along the way, I also, as, as Bob was um, talking about, you just gotta be careful, you gotta be responsible you know, you got to have your ducks in a row. Um, you know, I went back to school at one point um, to an art school, just, just you know, in case it, all this stuff didn't work out and also to further my own uh, design education. So, um, yeah, that, that is my story. And I, that's a, I think that's a really important thing, you know, and I've been having that conversation a lot right now with the current situation. You know, what, what happens to your income if, there's not any marching band or winter guard for a year. You know, if we were to face that, you have to have something that is going to still provide income. And so, I, you know, I've been telling a lot of people that are just wanting to be pageantry people that you have to realize that it's almost like a, a luxury hobby and you, you really need to have something in place that's a just in case situation. You know, I mean, I could easily go back to the classroom if I truly had to, or, you know, I also do real the other side of things that, and I think that's an important thing for people to think about if you're, if you're wanting to do this for a living. Tim? Uh, I think I must be next. Um, 
which is kind of crazy. I, I'm thinking back, I've been writing for 20 plus years now, but I'm the lowest on the seniority <laughs> uh, totem pole right now. Um, so how I got into this is similar to Mike's situation instead of, but not from Winter Guard, it was from Winter Percussion. Um, and, and I remember the first, I was writing percussion books kind of as my, um, you know, my side hustle. And the group that I was writing for, I was writing the percussion book and they needed a drill writer. And Wayne, Mark was and I were sitting in the room together and the band director says, well, Tim, you write drill, don't you? And I said, yep. And I never even opened up the Pyware program at that point. So I was, I like crash course in about three months. Um, I made my part of my first payment to buy Pyware and uh, taught myself in three months and made about every mistake possible I could, which was good to get those out of the way. Yeah. Um, but then in around 1997, 98, 99, I was lucky enough to move to Centerville and meet Mike, actually. And he was the reason, um, because I was working at Centerville as a percussion director, and I was writing a percussion book. And then I found out how much he was making and how much I was making. And I was like, ooh, I think I need to figure this out. Uh, just a per hour cost analysis. Um, for, because, and then I realized it's really just supply and demand, that there's a thousand or 10,000 percussionists out there that are writing drum books. And there's 50 or 60 good drill writers out there. And, but there's still the same amount of marching bands. Um, and, and I had a, a math background in college, which fit well into intervals and step sizes and those kind of things, but always loved art and design. And those, you know, working the left hand and the right hand side of the brain together seems to be the, a, a good kind of composition for a drill writer. That's why I got to do it. Good deal. Well, we have a question from Christopher. <clears throat> asking what are some of the standard books to have in my library pertaining to drill writing? I can get one. <laughs> I have to admit, I don't have any drill writing books per se, um, but uh, oh, 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 okay. okay, I was gonna say, I have some, I have some design books, but I'll let so Kevin. This one is, is a great learning tool. Steal like an artist. Yeah. It's a great learning tool. Can you expound on that? You know, it's just kind of a philosophical book about um, what artistry is. And it kind of goes back to like, you know, um, just hardly anything is really original. It's hard to think that something is original. It's basically an original look at something that's already happened. And I think when you're new and starting out, that's, I, we probably all did that at some point where you watched something that you thought was great and then you did your version of it or you expanded on it. And so a lot of the times that's, that's a, like a great, it's a validation that pretty much everybody kind of does that at some point to get farther in the business, you know, and, and that's kind of what this book is. It's, it kind of talks about how to do that in an in a, um, ethical way, I think, is really important. And it's just a good, it's just a good book on art is what it is. So I highly recommend it. It's, it's short, it's simple, it's an easy read and it's kind of a good refresher. Every now and then when you get like, your brain is fog, you just kind of read a few pages of that. I don't have, I don't have the book handy with me, but one of, it's not a drill writing book, but one of my favorite books is Picture This. It's by Molly Bang, came out in the early nineties. And for me, it, it's, a, it's a very simple book, but it talks about, um, like, if you take this shape and set it next to this one over here, what that feels like, how you can elicit fear or danger. Um, the, it makes a wolf. It kind of goes through Little Red Riding Hood story um, and how a triangle sitting next to a cliff is way different than a triangle sitting on top of a cliff. And those kind of design principles um, that seem so simple you really use those when you're using drill design on like this group of color guard over here balanced with this shape going around it uh, will feel one way with the music versus uh, if it was in a square around the outside of it framing it. So that's a uh, picture of this by Molly Bang is one of my recommendations. Uh, th there are a couple of books that, that uh, again, I'm like you, I, I think I own Wayne Marksworth's book and 
actually Ken Snook did a wonderful book years and years ago um, on, and it was called around 1981 or two contemporary drill design. And, you know, drill design is contemporary. I mean, it, it just sort of is that way, but the two books that I've sort of keyed in on were uh, one is by uh, Arnheim. It's called art and visual design. And um, actually chops Gary Chapinski turned me onto that book. Um, and it's, but it's a very, very uh, detailed book. And it, it talks about all the components of art, you know, form and uh, shape and balance and color and focus and direction. Uh, so many really, really neat things that really apply to what we do if we approach it as an art. Um, and the other one is, um, is called, and I think it's out of print. It's called um, Design Yourself. If you can find a, a, a book, it sounds a lot like the, the book Tim was talking about, but I remember that the thing I always remember from it is what he called safe design, which was simple, appropriate, functional, and efficient. And, and you know, if you can accomplish that in a show and, and still people understand what the show is about, you pretty much done your job. And, and as we know, uh, as designers, most of, the, most of the stuff that we see um, is a little overwritten. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, there are people trying to do things that are just a little beyond, uh, or some cases a lot beyond the, the student's ability. Um, so it's not simple and it's not appropriate and it's not functional and it's not efficient. So if you don't accomplish those things, um, you haven't done a very good job. And his examples of those in design were things like the original Volkswagen. You know, uh, it, 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 it does all of those things. The paperclip, you know, what can you think of that's any more appropriate or simple that does the job any better? So I think that's one of the things that, uh, that designers need to look for is just make sure that, um, that that can be accomplished. Then you can expand that. Then when you get to, you know, when I watch um, Michael's work, I'm just fascinated with the, with all the rules that I think are rules that he breaks so efficiently. And, <laughs> and, and they're so wonderful because of that, but you also have a whole different level of performer that you're dealing with as well too. Michael, I know you have a few books. <laughs> I do, yeah. But, uh, you know, going to what, what Bob was just talking about, um, I do think that, um, you know, making something that's simple seem really complex is much easier than the opposite. Right. And I think the opposite is where the magic happens, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I, I won't get the quote right. There's, some, there's a great quote about making uh, the complex really simple. I think it was Mink, Charles Mingus, maybe. I don't know. You can Google it, but uh, that's where that's where you know you, you really set uh, craftsmanship apart from busyness, if that makes any sense. Um, and so I, I really I, I agree with what Bob was just saying. Just want to throw that in there. We have a question here. Um, is He's heard transcribing shows is a good way to learn drill writing. Is that true, or do you have any suggestions on that? 100% yes. 100%. 100%. Um, it's a great way to learn, whether it's, um, I mean, I even, that's how I learned Pyware, to be honest. I took some of my old drills, and, and during, like, <laughs> the, the off, when there was an off-season, <laughs> during the winter, um, I, you know, because I remember I had my first laptop. I felt like Do Doogie Hauser. I was inputting an old drill. And then that first season when I wrote drill on Pyware, because I went from those huge sheets that you, you know, use pencil and paper um, to this tiny little laptop screen, I got in trouble right away realizing how much of the field I was taking up and how spread out they were because I was designing in this little screen. So it was a good, it was a good uh, practice for that. And if, if you're just starting out, absolutely find, find a drill that maybe you're helping with the band, maybe you just graduated high school, you marched the band, find one of those and transcribe it and then rewrite it, you know, do it, do it your own way. It, the, the, the tool is there. Um, and it, and the more, um, what's the word? 
the better you are using the tool, um, the easier it's going to be to bring whatever's in your head to life. Agree with that. Uh, you know, having taught uh, two universities and teaching marching band techniques courses, particularly when students really showed an interest and really wanted to, to delve into drill, because a lot of marching band technique is really has nothing to do with, with drill design. Uh, maybe it has a lot to do with design, but what I would do is I would have them literally take things off of, off of a video. And, um, and I, I used to do that myself. And of course, anybody that's been in this business very long, somebody has said, oh, I'd like for you to do the Bridgman 83 opener with the Phantoms right. you know, 94 closer, you know, that kind of stuff. So you, you know, you learn to get pretty good at that. Um, but I've learned so much doing it, watching uh, particularly the, the really skilled drum corps guys do it. Um, I remember uh, one of my customers um, had me transcribe the, the Santa Clara show that, um, uh, that won, I guess, 88 or 89, and Myron Rosander had written it. And what was really fascinating about that show is he just found ways to make numbers work. And... And so he would, you would, you'd look at the video, all of a sudden you'd, you'd see a person you hadn't seen before and he had hidden them behind someone. So I, I thought, and then I, I started realizing, geez, I, you know, I'm always trying to square all the corners and make everything work exactly like that. And he sort of had figured out some ways to do that, but I just think it's great training for you. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and it, and it also, when you transcribe it from a video, you sort of understand direction thing. So there's a lot of people will write drill and I watch young drill writers in my classes write it and everything's just jerky. You know, it, it just, it doesn't have a flow where it just sort of moves in a fashion that's satisfying. And uh, so a lot of times just watching people that know how to accomplish that just makes all the difference in the world. And not to mention things, you know, staging, uh, you know, getting people in the right place, particularly the color guard. Um, and, you know, one of the things that always amazed me about uh, Michael's work is that, particularly with Cavaliers, is the proximity to the to the brass and percussion that the that the color guard performed. But more than that, you you learn how to manipulate people into and out of forms. So there's a lot to be learned from transcribing shows for sure. I'm going to just piggyback on that just a little bit because I think this is this is an important lesson I've learned over the years. Um, what Bob was saying about the complexity, and I found myself early on writing to the page, like, I want this page to be very cool. And then the next page, I want that page to be very cool. And then the next page, I want that one to be very cool. And over the years, I've stopped, right, like painting with the little tiny brush on every page. And I've started painting with a much bigger brush. And oftentimes, like if, let's say for color guard transitions or things like that, I, I find myself spreading my page tab. Like, you know, 15 years ago, I was like 15 subsets per eight counts, you know? And now I'm thinking like way bigger picture and that helps the students, that helps the, the clients. Um, and pick your spots to paint with a tiny brush, but really in general, if the big brush strokes are correct, then the show's gonna be correct. Mm -hmm. Good description. You're muted, Dustin. Our, our winner is in the room with us. I'm going to pull him in here and have a few words from him. All right. Let's see if we can get Eric in here. Eric, are you with us? I'm here. Hello. How you doing, Eric? Congratulations, sir. Thank you so much. Um, I'm blown away by this. I uh, honestly got into this for the, the challenge to, to teach myself how to write at this interval if, if this was something that was we were all going to have to do. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Thank you to all the judges for, for your kind words. I really appreciate it. Well, <clears throat> can you give some insight on uh, your thoughts on your design process for it? There we go. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, you know, make sure that the music sounds good. So um, nothing changed from that perspective as far as 
making sure everything was staged appropriately. Um, but having attended some of the, the, the night class, Tyler night classes, a lot of things that people were talking about as far as, you know, writing that, that first impact moment, sort of writing backwards, you know, developing to that moment. So I was able to apply a lot of that stuff that we normally do. Um, even the ending idea as well, charting that out before anything, knowing that that's where I wanted to, wanted to get to that moment by the end by the end of the production and then make it interesting to get there. Okay. That, was kind of, that was kind of the thought process. And, you know, another way I thought about it was, you know, I wrote for, for numbers that I was comfortable with mm -hmm. or perhaps one, you know, one of my bands and thinking about, you know, what, how would I want to set the color guard up for the team that I'm working with to do their magic and, course I had to do some more of the animation that I typically don't don't normally do um, but it was a lot of fun it really was so thank you all so much well thank you for taking taking time to do it, it we time. have a the uh, question of the day as it were how often do you all write backwards I know <clears throat> at some point in time we've all asked that individually but let's let's go around the table and see uh how often you write backwards, or if <clears throat> that's something that you never do, so. I, I probably do it on every drill, multiple every times. Time. Yeah, it's very common for me, and I'm, I'm so glad that tool is there because it makes things a lot easier. You know, especially if, you, if your first arrival point is a minute into the show, you have to know what that's going to be. You don't want it to just be something you got to randomly so get being able to plot that and work backwards to the beginning is such an amazing tool that we didn't used to be able to do <laughs> you know you had to you had to write it eight or ten times before you got it right, right. <laughs> so so yeah i i do it constantly even in the middle of things you know if you if you know you want the woodwind feature to look a certain way then you can plot the woodwind feature and then go back to where you are and work towards it you know, and, and that's just, it's just the tool that I constantly use. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people do, um, or, or I do a lot of that first impact. I mean, that's almost always my first page of drill is wherever the first hold is, and then work backward from that. That's pretty commonplace. Um, I've experimented a couple times because being a percussion teacher also, if I'm ever teaching a piece of music, I always start at the end and we always learn the last couple bars first and then we add on from that. So the most reps they're getting, uh, it builds on from the end instead of the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and I've actually experimented a couple times with writing the entire show backwards and then also teaching the show backwards. So teaching the kids the very, very last set and then teaching the set before that. So when they go to that first show, instead of starting the opener and ending halfway through the ballad, maybe we start at the beginning of the ballad and go to the closer. So the end is always really, really strong. I've experimented with that. It's not easy to do that, but it's, it's a fun, um, the, the kids always end on a high note that way. Right. Uh, am I next? If you'd like to be. Uh, I would say close to 100% of the shows I write, I have portions of it that are backwards. and. I'm old enough, you know, I, I hear, uh, I hear you guys talk about this, but um, I'm old enough that I wrote backwards by hand. <laughs> and some of the people that influenced me early on were uh, um, Bobby Hoffman. And, um, and, and he was, you know, he, there was no, there was not a book, you know, there was just Bobby telling you how he would arrive at things. And he's the one that said, yeah, I, I write backwards sometimes. And, and, it sort of clicked with me that that would be a way to do it. And of course, if you're writing, I was using Mylar paper, uh, you know, film on, on paper. And so it was very simple to go forward or backwards. The, the nice thing, the thing that Pyware has saved us with is the instrumentation. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times I find myself get to that first arrival point and then I set the instrumentation the way I want it uh, for, that, for that arrival point. And, um, you can't always do that. Obviously, things things get in the way sometimes of making that happen. But what a great tool it is to be able to do that. Yeah, I echo everything everyone said. Um, 
it, it's it's a great thing to be able to do. Um, it's it's almost it's not even backwards anymore, really. It's more um, multi-directional because you're constantly, you know. I think, I think like Kevin was alluding to, where one you might be riding the woodwinds backwards, but maybe you're riding the brass forward, or you know, all all those kind of things. So it's right. really it's just a constant evolution as opposed to just one thing. Now a lot, yeah, a lot of people do do the impact. I, you know, as your first set, um, certainly a lot of shows I do that as well. Um, I would just caution, I guess, people to just because you're writing backwards doesn't mean um, that it doesn't matter. That it's okay to just have all this stuff <laughs> uh, before before the you know before it really locks in. Like you still have to compose backwards. Um, you know, there's there's more smoke and mirrors you can do, I suppose. But uh, you know, and even something we talked about, um, you can tell the uh, experience level or the talent level of a writer once you start watching right after the first impact. You know, because a lot of people have a real pretty first impact, and because they wrote backwards, right? So you're kind of waiting to see, okay, where's all this leading? Not sure what this is. Oh, that's really nice. Right after that, that's that's when it's a true test of craftsmanship and uh, composition, in, in my opinion, in my experience. Um, so just, you know, just be really careful about use it as a tool, but don't use it to cheat, I guess is what I would say. I agree. Yeah, and one thing that I've found helps with that is that, like, if I'm writing that first impact, I'm thinking about what that next thing is. Like, if it's going to be a woodwind feature, then that front line all folds in, and I know, like, I do that set first. So I'm kind of writing backward, not from the first hit, but like you said, from the thing that happens after it. Or if you're writing from the very end of the show all the way forward, then you, you you're definitely doing that. Right. Awesome. Well, do we have any other questions for our uh, panelists here? Well, <clears throat> wanted to thank everybody again. Yeah, Dustin, how'd you get into drill? <laughs> How did I get in drill? Well, yeah, you didn't answer the question. I'll, I'll answer the question. I've never written a drill in my life. <laughs> but you've saved thousands of drills. <laughs> yes. I've has. assisted many, many times. Yeah. So, but yeah, I started in, started with Pyware in 1998, 97, 98. I was uh, just getting, <clears throat> it was my junior year of high school between my junior, senior year. Um, I just came on board and doing some uh, inner office things and I just kind of learned my way up as it were. <laughs> so. We <clears throat> appreciate you. <laughs> so I, I want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, we have a question from Kefi. Should you focus on woodwinds and brass as the main focus of image of images? How do you learn to integrate your guard and drum line? Should you focus on woodwind and brass as a main focus of image? Would, would your uh, guard and drum line always be secondary to your winds, is what I'm interpreting that as? Yeah, so I, 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 the night I did the particular class myself, I, I mentioned that I tend to stage the color guard first um, for you know, depending on where they're competing, but most of the bands I do are going to BOA on some level at a regional or something. And because of the way those sheets are scored, the, the overall effectiveness of the product is extremely important. And so I tend to stage the color guard first, unless it's imperative that the winds be the focus, I, I guess is the best way to say that. Um, you know, I definitely want to make sure that the instrumentation is in the right place to play the melody and they're not on the five yard line because I put the color guard in the 50. But in general, I want to make sure that the color guard is staged correctly before anything else. And I don't know, I'm not saying that's right, but that's just the way that I do it. So I certainly don't, I, I don't make them secondary for sure. Great. Anybody else have insight on that? Yeah, I, I, I'll say some things. I think a lot of that has to do with storyboarding your show as well, whether it's the program notes you get from the client or once you get the notes, what you 
what you actually intend to do um, because the guard is going to be picking up whatever the musical um, focus is. So making the woodwinds and brass is the main focus of the image. I'm not really thinking about the image. That's like the page, right? I'm thinking about what is the audience looking at and what are they, they're going to be looking at what's playing, right? Because your eyes going to go to what they hear. And then what color guard uh, element is picking that up. I think that's one of the most important things. And as far as the drum line goes, being a percussionist, I, I obviously, I want the drum line to be in the best positions to play together. Um, but if they can be included in what the image is and be connected, um, I, what I really don't like is the kind of like floating eyebrow that just kind of goes back and forth behind the 50 that just plays for the, for the rest of the horn line. Um, they should be integrated or involved in the design elements, but also in um, places where they can play really well together. Anybody else? Uh, along with that, we have uh, any, any thoughts on social distancing with percussion? Uh, the thought that I had in watching all these shows was that uh, I would think that in many cases, they're going to be a lot, uh, the, the bands that are successful uh, may have to simplify some in the percussion section. And I would, I'm not a percussionist, but I would think primarily maybe snare tenor. I think the bass drums are accustomed to playing it with some space and they'll probably make that work. But uh, when I would watch these drills, I would, I would think, you know, that's, that's not going to work really, really well. Um, of course, every time I think that, you know, something like that can't be done, you know, I, I start thinking about uh, cadets running, you know, all over the field with, with percussion sections and, and playing at a really high level. And, and what the, these uh, students can achieve today is just unbelievable. And, but a lot of that comes from the fact that somebody's really thought through it about how to do it. And, um, and, and that makes it work. Yeah, and as far as the, um, the six foot distance, if I had to write a drill that had social distancing, the tenors, the bass drums and the cymbals are all gonna be fine. And any group that uses the six foot grid in the winter, they're gonna be at that 3.2 interval. Um, I actually write a lot of my high school marching band drum lines at the 3.2s and the 1.6s, where they're just using the tick marks all the time. So my bass drummers and cymbal players are never like trying to mark steps off. They're just looking forward at the ticks and they're lining up with the six foot spaces that are already on the yard marks. For the snares, that's where it gets a little tricky, but I, if I'm gonna do that, I'm probably gonna put the snares at a 3.2 and then pull the, eight, the evens and the odds apart and stack them front to back. So they're six feet front to back uh, kind of windowed. So everybody's still six feet apart. And, and really the back people wouldn't have to be exactly six feet from the front people just because they're on a little bit of a triangle. You could probably just go three steps behind them instead of 3.2. Uh, but I think percussion wise, the snares are the only ones that would be a difficult thing. Everybody else is pretty sad at the 3.2. Anybody else want to chime in on that question? We have another question from Cameron. Um, much of my drill writing inspiration is in this call. He wants to know what's your greatest inspiration creativity, create creatively? either drill related or somewhere else pageantry, in the pageantry arts. Who wants to take that one first? Uh, I'll, I'll sort of address it. Um, it's always fascinated me to see people that could manipulate bodies and, and, and make things work and make it possible to do. So I started watching when I, particularly when I, you know, I mentioned AR cast event, but I also watched, um, you know, a lot of the designers, I mentioned Bobby Hoffman and uh, Pete Emmons and uh, Mike Moxley. Um, a lot of those guys are really big influences on me. Uh, but one of the things that, that I discovered somewhere along the line, the, the path was that what we do is everywhere. 
once you learn the mechanics of it, it's sort of like a really great arranger. If he hears it in his head and he's, he's got the mechanics of how to put it on paper to make it sound good, I, I think it's pretty much like we are. I think all of us, nothing intimidates us in terms of, you know, the, the actual mathematics or the, uh, the, the design of it. I think the, the big thing is, is that if we see something that inspires us in art or we see, and it used to be you go to band shows or drum corps shows and see people, they would make sketches of sets. You know, they would, they would just draw sets and, and now I find when I, when I get stuck writing drill, I still go back and watch other work, not to try to steal that work, but I always see some little thing that reminds me of something that I had not thought about previously. And um, so I think we continue to get that inspiration really from each other. Um, you know, I'm, I get excited sometimes if I see somebody that's figured out a new way to get in and out of a little block. You know, it's like, oh, that's cool. And I'm probably the only person that notices that that's within 50 yards of me. So that's kind of where I am. I think that I think the inspiration for me comes from from anything graphic and and, and art. Um, I really like I find, find that I, I don't know enough about art to really say that I have a great appreciation for it but I, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy looking at it and learning from it and, and making, drawing my own conclusions. And I think that's really probably what most artists want us to do anyway. Yeah. Great. Uh, for me, it's things that are um, musically coordinated. If it's, if it's something that affects, it affects me emotionally and it was musically coordinated with something. So, the the things that come to mind is like the first Cirque shows I saw were um, to me it was interesting that they had the ability to have you know the entire cast on the stage and still create focus and they were able to create big arrival points in the show that was coordinated with the music and so it was kind of a combination of, wow, that's really all three things that we need to do as designers when it comes to drill. You need to create logic and you need to create focus and it all has to coordinate with the music as well. So, you know, watching, watching people do that in a um, more obvious scenario was, was something that I kind of learned from early on and took note from. You know, movies do that all the time. You know, the, the great moment in the movie is culminated by a great music score and that's what makes it work and and so I think figuring out when you're designing a marching band show how to do that when when the color guard the the arrival drills form and the music come together and create this great moment is you know part of the art of doing what we do right Tim Michael who, where do you draw your creativity from <clears throat> Um, you know, I, it's a tough question because at, at different points in your, yeah. it, you know, at different points in your, your growth or your learning curve, different things. It's always kind of like the, the moment I'm in, for example, when I was marching, um, you know, in Winter Garden, I watched Sal Salas push people around by hand on the floor. I was fascinated, just fascinated. Or if I was in Cavaliers watching what Steve Brubaker did. And then even once I started teaching, it was always whoever was doing something better than I knew how to do, it was like, oh my God, I got so much to learn. You know, and like, how did they do that? Or, and even now, and it, it goes back to, I think it was, I think it was what Bob was saying about, you know, when you're hanging around your, your peers, people who do the same thing you do and being able to, you know, like if I, if I sat down with all of you and we watched a show, we would like, uh, Bob was saying he was the only person within 50 miles that would notice something. I feel that way when I, you know, sit there and hang out, like if I'm hanging out with Tim or at BOA, it's always like Leon May, you know, we'll sit down and we'll, we'll give each other a bunch of crap about stuff, you know, about who stole what from whom. But, but, you know, just being able to point out things like, oh, did you see how they, the, they did that with the snares right there? Or things that normal, more normal people wouldn't notice, but because we practice the craft, you know, so, so much, it, it just, it jumps out and be like, that's really different. And so I, I think it's really, um, I don't know if it's a singular person or identity, or even just going, it like, uh, I love seeing um, 
like a ballet or a dance company that has a lot of people. Uh, like if you've ever seen Mark Morris, he does staging very similar to kind of what we do. And I feel drawn to that sometimes. And then uh, conversely, I'll go to, you know, like San Francisco ballet, be sitting with someone and, and think, you know what? There are so many people in our activity that could do that staging better, you know? That, like, I, and the reason, I mean, I'm going off on a tangent now, but a lot of times, like, even we don't have lighting, we don't have curtains, we don't have any of that. So we've had to figure all that out, how to always look good and be staged appropriately. Whereas in, you know, professional theater, um, Cirque, all those things, you know, just cut to black, everyone run, go get, go to the next set and lights are on. You know, we don't have that luxury. And so I think that there's a lot of people in our various activities that are really good, perhaps better than some of what are uh, traditionally considered the professionals. Yeah. I know it's blasphemous, but. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all great stuff, Mike. I totally agree with that. I, I find myself um, drawn to uh, not necessarily people, obviously people that are in this room right now have been inspirations for me. Um, I find what I'm drawn to, and it's silly sometimes like on Facebook, I don't know, I'm sure you guys have seen like the Italian motorcycle troupe that they like all come together and they all go around like, I see something like that and I'm like, oh, how could I do that in drill? Or you see this thing with the pendulums where they're swinging and you try like anything that's not drill, but I see that there's design and there's motion and there's evolution to the ideas. That makes me, that inspires me more than watching somebody else's drill. Cause I look at that and think, oh, okay, that was cool. I like that. I, I could probably figure out how to do that. But like this Italian motorcycle thing, I don't know that I, I could ever figure out how to do that. And then that makes me want to do something like that. Um, and then the other half of that is be because I'm more percussion minded, like I do independent world percussion a lot. When I get to go to WGI guard weekend, I'm, I'm like a sponge. Like what are they doing uh, design wise that these, the other half of the, or the other third of the activity isn't thinking about um, and for me, that's a really big inspiration. Well, I think we have one last question before we wrap up for tonight. <clears throat> it comes from Christopher. When is simple too simple? And when is too much too much? He's a high school band director and sometimes he sees visual design that doesn't enhance the musical content and then visual design that deprecate or depreciates the musical content. Uh, how do you find a happy medium? And any suggestions? Eric, do you want to chime in on this too? <laughs> oh boy. Uh, sure. Um, I think you have to pick and choose your moments. You know, there's no doubt about that. And know your client. Um, sometimes you can take something that's really simple and make it look complex. And I've learned that as I've gotten older. <laughs> The more I write, I've learned how to how to create those moments that might be, you know, looking very complex. There's lots of stuff going on, but honestly, they're uh, they're very complex. Um, I just thought for me that comes with experience, um, gaining that knowledge. You know, watching my peers, watching, you know, and saying, "Oh my gosh, that was that was really cool. How did they do that?" And that was not all that that complex for the, for the students, you know, so, yeah. Christopher, I think that uh, you, I'm sorry, Tim. Oh, you're good. I think that you kind of answered the question on your own and the fact that you're asking that question shows that you probably have a pretty good grasp of it already. Um, the fact that, you know, you do know <laughs> when, when one thing can be overbearing on another and it really just comes down to what's the priority at that point, you know, choose a priority, whether if, if, if you truly want it to be a visual moment, then you have to program accordingly, you know, or, or adjust accordingly. Um, and the same flip side with music, it's, it's, it goes, it's like that phrase, you know, uh, uh, pick your battles, choose your battles. It's kind of the same thing, choose your moments. Um, not every moment has to uh, feature every single part of the palette that you're using to create. In fact, I would advise start very simply, know what that moment is, 
um, in and of itself. What, what is the integrity of that moment? And then build around that. And always keep your eye on that as like the bullseye, the target. Always stay on target. If, it's, if something starts feeling uncomfortable, go back to the initial target. What was this moment supposed to be about? It was about the music there. Okay, let's calm everything else down. Bring it back to that moment. And if you have a variety of those moments throughout your show, that, that's fantastic. I mean, that's, that's the goal, you know? Um, but the fact that you're asking that question to me tells me that, that you're already pretty aware of that. Yeah, and I found that usually if, if you say, when is simple too simple and too much is too much, usually you can tell that just by watching it. Um, but one thing that I found from teaching one of the groups that I write for, sometimes you need to give things a week. Like I'll often teach a couple sets and I'll have the band director say, this just seems like it's so simple. And I'll say, give it a week. And if they march and play this perfectly, it won't feel simple. It'll feel powerful. Or he'll say, this feels like it's too much. And I'll say, well, they just learned it. Give it a week. And this is going to be really cool looking once they can do it, but they just learned it. And then a week later, he's like, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. So whether you think it's too simple or too much, sometimes it is worth it to just let the kids achieve it first. And then after a week, maybe you realize, yeah, this is too much or it's too simple, but it's often a good rule of thumb to give it a week. Yeah. Anybody else want to chime on that last question for us or? Could be. Well, I'll go ahead and wrap up tonight. Thanks for everybody who's joined us tonight. Michael, Bob, Tim, Kevin, Eric, congratulations, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for your work on this. It was very exciting. Uh, keep your eyes peeled. I think we're, we might be doing another one of these here shortly. So uh, just <clears throat> glad to have everybody along. Uh, be sure to uh, come to our next Pyware Night School next week, Wednesday, and we're also going to have um, Tony Deo on next Friday. So it should be a fun session. Until next time, guys, thank you so much, and y'all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dustin. Awesome. Good night. Bye. Night. Congratulations, Eric. Thank you.